live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. Some of the greatest performances in the history of the Super Bowl have come with a player badly injured, and have come when a player is battling through the pain to produce one of the most remarkable performances ever on the game's biggest stage. You had Tampa Bay Buccaneers quarterback Tom Brady playing with a torn MCL, and throwing for three touchdowns and no interceptions while posting a pass rating of 125.8 and winning the MVP of the Super Bowl, as his Bucks became the first team to ever win the big game in their home venue. Even though it came in a losing effort, you had Philadelphia Eagles wide receiver Terrell Owens, seven weeks after breaking his leg, tearing a ligament in his right ankle, and needing surgery, somehow playing in Super Bowl 39 and having 122 yards receiving. And you had Pittsburgh Steelers defensive end Dwight White, after almost dying in the hospital, recording a safety that helped his team win their first title in franchise history. To learn more about that heroic performance, click the card in the upper right corner. But oftentimes, with performances like these, there's a ton of survivorship bias at play here. Because there are other times, especially during the Super Bowl, where a player is badly injured, yet decides to give it a go, and decides to play in the game to not let his team down and to not let the opportunity go to waste, and it ends in disaster. And man, was that the case here. At Super Bowl 16, one player on the Cincinnati Bengals decided to play the game while injured, and it resulted in a historically bad performance that may have ultimately cost his team the game. And this is the story behind the worst performance by an injured player in Super Bowl history. Before I talk about the performance in question, we need some context to understand who the player is, how bad his injury was, and why he was even able to play in the Super Bowl in the first place. Our story begins in 1981, when the Cincinnati Bengals desperately needed to draft a wide receiver. Their receivers from the previous year were atrocious, and this was clearly a weak spot on the team. Only one receiver had more than 500 receiving yards during the 1980 season, and that was Isaac Curtis, who was on the wrong side of 30, and likely had one, maybe two years left at a prime level. And only one other receiver, Don Bass, had more than 300 yards. The Bengals knew that if they were going to improve in 1981 after a 6-10 record the previous year, that they were going to need to bolster up their passing game. With that, they spent their first round pick on the man you're watching right now. Meet Kansas wide receiver David Verser. Verser was one of the most electric receivers in the entire Big 8 Conference. With the Jayhawks, he led the conference in yards per reception in both 1979 and 1980, led the conference in receiving touchdowns in 1980, and finished second in that category in 1979, and finished second in the conference in receiving yards in both 1979 and 1980. In fact, not only did Verser become the first player in Kansas history to lead the Big 8 in yards per reception in back-to-back -back seasons, but he became just the second player ever alongside Iowa State wide receiver Willie Jones in the early 70s to accomplish this feat. It was this electrifying big play ability that made him the first receiver off the board in the first round of the 1981 NFL Draft, as the Bengals spent the 10th overall selection on this man. As a side note, to learn more about that 1981 NFL Draft, particularly a story involving Lawrence Taylor, click the card in the upper right corner. However, Burster did not make an immediate impact as a receiver during his rookie season. Part of the reason why that was was because there was a receiver that the Bengals drafted with their second round pick that you might have heard of that ended up beating him out on the depth chart. That player was Chris Collinsworth, and he had 67 receptions for 1,009 yards as a rookie. Verser, on the other hand, was buried and struggled to get playing time ahead of him and Curtis. By the time his rookie season ended, he had just 6 receptions for 161 yards and 2 touchdowns. It was a fairly underwhelming season for the first year player offensively especially when the man drafted after him was a second-team All-Pro and came second in Offensive Rookie of the Year voting. However, that's not to say that Verser didn't make an immediate impact with the Bengals that season, because even though he didn't do a whole lot on offense, he was quite the asset on special teams. I don't think anyone expected Verser to be used a whole lot on special teams, especially as a kick returner. This was a man who only returned two kickoffs during his senior season with the Jayhawks, and only had 11 kick returns for 163 yards in his four seasons at Kansas. However, since he couldn't exactly contribute on offense being so far buried on the depth chart, he was going to make an impact in the other phase of the game. And surprisingly enough, despite not having a whole lot of experience as a kick returner, Verser was quite good when thrust into the role, and quickly became one of the best return men in football. During the 16-game season, Verser had 29 kick returns, which was easily the most on the team, as no one else was even in double digits. Verser was far and away the primary kick returner on the 1981 Bengals. And on those 29 returns, even though he never found the end zone, he picked up 691 yards, averaging 23.8 yards per return. There were some solid performances in the mix as well, such as a return of 70-plus yards against the Cleveland Browns in Week 3, some nice returns against the New York Jets in Week 2 in their thrilling 31-30 victory, and over 30 yards per return in their regular season meeting against the San Francisco 49ers. 
which as we would find out, would not be the last time the two sides met during the 1981 season. A little bit of foreshadowing, if you will. As for his average of 23.8 yards per return, the Bengals struggled heavily on special teams the previous year, averaging just 17.6 yards per return, with no one averaging over 20 yards. Among players with at least 20 returns, Verser was the first returner in Bengals history since Willie Shelby back in 1976 to average at least 23 yards per return. And among players with at least 25 returns, Verser had the second highest single season average in team history at the time, only behind Shelby's 1976 campaign. Verser also ranked sixth in the NFL in yards per kick return, only behind Mike Nelms of Washington, Carl Roaches of Houston, Fulton Walker of Miami, Reggie Smith of Atlanta, and Willie Tullis of Houston. Safe to say as a kick returner, Verser seemed legit, but something would happen during the AFC Championship that would change everything. After the Cincinnati Bengals won their first playoff game in franchise history by defeating the Buffalo Bills 28-21, they were hosting the AFC Championship. As a side note, if you want to learn more about that Bengals-Bills divisional round game, click the card in the upper right corner. In this game dubbed as the Freezer Bowl, thanks to a wind chill that was minus 59 degrees according to the old formula, the Bengals prevailed over the San Diego Chargers, winning a 27-7 to advance to their first Super Bowl in franchise history, from 6-10 to the Super Bowl against an NFC West team. Hard to imagine such a remarkable turnaround by the Bengals happening again. But for the purposes of our story, something happened during this game that impacted Verser tremendously. He had one kickoff return, and it was a really nice one, as he took it 40 yards. In fact, this second quarter return was one of his best kick returns of the entire season. But on the play, even though you can't tell, he suffered a pretty nasty thumb injury. Not sure how it happened, but this was the first and last time all day that he touched the ball. Things seemed to be bleak with regards to Verser playing in the Super Bowl, especially since he tore a ligament in his right thumb. You need that to catch and grip a football, and the recovery time on such an injury is usually anywhere from four to six weeks. But Verser was determined to play in this game. He wasn't going to let a torn thumb ruin his opportunity. While Verser was unable to move his thumb normally, when wearing an appliance made specifically for him and his thumb, he could move it, even though there was obvious pain. As head coach Forrest Gregg said, we had an appliance made for it specially. He can move his thumb with the appliance on. And Greg was confident that Verser was going to be able to play in this game, saying a few days before the game, our team is basically in good condition. David Verser was the big question mark, but he has worked every day since we've been here and can also return kicks, so we're in good shape there. Despite a torn ligament in his thumb, despite being badly in pain, and despite a ton of questions surrounding his injury status and his availability, he was going to tough it out and play in the biggest stage of his football career. And guys, it was a disaster. January 24, 1982. We're at the Pontiac Silverdome for Super Bowl 16 between the Cincinnati Bengals and the San Francisco 49ers. The stakes are simple. The winner wins their first professional football title in franchise history, and the loser comes up just one win short of football's biggest prize. It's the most watched Super Bowl of all time at the time, drawing an average of 85.2 million viewers and pulling what still remains the highest TV rating of any Super Bowl ever, pulling a 49.1 Nielsen rating. And the big question among those 85.2 million people especially Bengals fans who had monitored the situation over the previous two weeks, was how David Verser was going to perform with this torn ligament in his thumb, and with this special device on his thumb to help him move it. The answer was very simple and very apparent right away. Not well. In fact, he was historically bad, but we'll get to the awful historical nature of this performance in a bit. As a reminder, before I talk about each return that he had, remember that Verser was sixth in the NFL in yards per return, and was averaging just under 24 yards per return all season. Keep that in mind when I bring up how awful he was on this day. On the first kickoff, he fields it and is only able to pick up 14 yards. The sad part was that this was one of his better returns of the day. On the second kickoff, he badly misplays it, is unable to field it cleanly, and then gets just one yard out of it after finally recovering. This is where you can see that thumb injury coming into play. During the regular season, he fields that kick with ease, as he had done tons of times. But with a torn thumb ligament? Yeah, not as easy. By the end of the first half, the Bengals were down 20 to nothing, and Verser was fielding the opening kickoff of the second half. He picked up 16 yards on the runback, with the Bengals once again unable to start from beyond the 20-yard line, which is where a touchback went to at the time. The good news on the fourth kick is that finally, the Bengals are starting past the 20. The bad news is that Verser badly misplays this one, lets the ball bounce over his head by mistiming the jump or misjudging the path of the football as he picks up just 8 yards on the return. And on his final return of the game, with the Bengals down 26-14, he picks up a mere 15 yards. By the time the game ended, the 49ers were victorious, winning a 26-21 to win their first Super Bowl ever. There were many reasons why the Bengals came up short, 
but perhaps none were as obvious as with what happened with David Verser. Because when you put this game in the appropriate historical context, it was historically bad. The final box score for David Verser at Super Bowl 16 was not flattering to say the least. He finished the game with 5 returns for 52 yards, averaging an abysmal 10.4 yards per return. To show how uncharacteristic this game was for him, and just how badly he was struggling with that injury and with fielding the ball cleanly, here is a graph showing every game he had that season with at least 3 kickoff returns. Including the playoffs but excluding the Super Bowl, he had 5 such games. He averaged at least 23.5 yards per return 3 times, and had at least 17 yards per return in all 5 of them. But at Super Bowl 16, again, just 10.4 yards per return. It was quite easily his worst performance of the season. But not only was it his worst performance of the year, it was also the worst performance in Super Bowl history by a kick returner. And I do not say that lightly. In the 56-year history of the Super Bowl, I looked at every return man to have at least three returns. In total, there were 67 of these players. Near the top, you have guys like Miami Dolphins returner Fulton Walker at Super Bowl 17, who had 47.5 yards per return, Atlanta Falcons returner Tim Dwight at Super Bowl 33, who had 42 yards per return, and Baltimore Ravens wide receiver Jacoby Jones at Super Bowl 47, who had 41.2 yards per return. Those are the only three men to ever eclipse the 40 yard per return mark with that criteria, as the median number is 21 yards per return. And then at the very bottom, you have David Verser at Super Bowl 16 with his awful 10.4 yards per return. Not only did this rank dead last among 67 kick returners in this illustrious history of the Super Bowl, but this was more than a full yard and a half behind the next lowest total. He is the only player in Super Bowl history to have at least three kick returns and average less than 12 yards on them. Some credit obviously has to go to San Francisco for playing lights down on special teams, and for executing their squib kick strategy, which was a novel concept at the time, flawlessly. It also directly led to points at the end of the first half after Archie Griffin mishandled the kickoff badly. But it was very obvious that Verser was not at full strength. And unfortunately for Verser, this game was a pretty bad omen of what was to come in his career. Not a lot of Bengals fans have good memories of David Verser, especially after that Super Bowl. And that's because, quite bluntly, He's one of the biggest busts in the history of the franchise. Some argue that outside of Achilles Smith, because he's easily number one when you consider his draft position, the position he played on the field, and the offers that the Bengals turned down specifically so they could draft him, that David Verser is the biggest bust in the over half-century-long history of the franchise. He did absolutely nothing after that 1981 season, and after the worst performance of all time by any kick returner in Super Bowl history, it was all downhill from there. Verser was never able to crack his way into the starting lineup as a wide receiver, which is why all of the clips you're watching right now are of him returning kicks. He had four receptions for 98 yards and a touchdown during the strike short in 1982 season, and had seven receptions for 82 yards in 1983. He was also splitting the kick return reps with the likes of John Simmons and Ronnie Tate, so he was falling out of favor with the coaching staff. After the 1984 season, where he had just three kick returns and six receptions, he never played another down for the Bengals. He spent some time with the Buccaneers and the Browns in the mid-80s, but his career stat line in Cincinnati for the first receiver off the board and a top 10 pick was an embarrassing 23 receptions for 454 yards and three touchdowns. Jamar Chase in the month of January 2022 alone put up better numbers than Verser did during his entire career. On one hand, you can admire the toughness that Verser had to play at Super Bowl 16. Doing anything with a torn thumb ligament, let alone playing a football game, has to be absolutely brutal. Kudos to him for toughing it out and wanting to play in the game. However, there are some moments where playing a game injured is not in the best interest of the team. The 49ers did this with Paul Cofer during the same Super Bowl, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And the Bengals learned this lesson the hard way with Verser's abysmal display. Because not only did Verser tear his thumb, but he tore the hearts of Bengals fans across the country with the worst performance by a kick returner in the history of the Super Bowl. Get your official Jaguar Gamer 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed out to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jaguar9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel, your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.